Hello, my name is Isaiah and welcome to another overclocking guide. Today we're going to talk about the RTX 380 and overclocking. Now there's been a few people out there on YouTube and the interwebs has been making articles and making videos about overclocking. So I figured I'd give it a shot and give you guys kind of my idea on how I go about overclocking, especially when it comes to review cycles and how I do it. So here is the Founders Edition I have right here. And what we're actually going to overclock is this MSI Gaming X Trio card that I reviewed. Both video cards are in the link below if you want to read the review, but that's not really what this uh, video is about. It's actually about overclocking the video card. Now, things to note quickly is that both these video cards draw a lot of power. This card is 350 watts, and the Founders Edition here is 370 watts once you raise the power limit. So make sure that you have a power supply that can handle at least 320, which is the default for both video cards. Now this is 320 and that's 340, but more or less, if you have a computer that can power these video cards, overclocking is just gonna raise that power even higher. Now if you have something like the EVGA for the Win 3, that has a 420 watt bias power limit. So you really you need to watch out if you don't have a power supply that can handle this amount of power you uh, probably shouldn't be overclocking or even using one of these video cards, but that's beside the point. Next thing before we actually jump onto the computer and into the overclocking part is that this is something that you want to be cautious about. Um, I can't guarantee any overclocks that I get or you're going to get. If you somehow damage your video card, well, that's on you. Once again, NVIDIA makes it really hard to actually damage their video cards from overclocking because they have a safe voltage, they have a power limit, they have a temperature limit. So out of the box factory, breaking it, not really possible, but there's always a chance. And once again, I don't want to be blamed for what you do. If you have a weak power supply and you overclock and your power supply blows up, well, you, you said, oh, I watched this video and that's why my computer blew up. Well. It probably would have blown up eventually anyways, but it happened to overclock and sped that up. So, so just make sure all your components are actually up to spec. They can handle this kind of uh, video card and also make sure that your computer can handle the dissipation of the heat. There's a lot of heat that these things put out. Um, just like the reviews I talked about and other people were talking about in their reviews is that you need a case that has good airflow. Here I have the Fantex, I think 719 they changed it or that was called now. The Lux 2 or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they keep changing the name on it, and then uh, pretty much I have a lot of fans blowing air out, and that helps with my overclocking and just gaming in general. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump onto the computer. I am recording this with a separate computer. This is my computer that I'm actually doing it with, and the computer down there is the one I'm recording it with. And it makes it easier to kind of show what's going on when it comes to overclocking. Okay, now onto the actual overclocking part on the computer itself. I am recording it with a different computer, so if I do end up with a crash, uh, it will not affect the video at all. And it'll be helpful because then you can kind of see what happens when you get a crash. A lot of videos don't do that, and then you kind of are left in the dark what happens. Anyways, um, before we get too far into this, I want to point out that if you just want to type in the values I type in, they're probably not going to work. I will put a timestamp on where I'm going to when I start moving the sliders around and all that, but if you were to type those value, values in, it probably is not going to work. That being said, let's go ahead and actually start the over overclocking section. So these are the programs I like to use. Um, I think they're pretty standard today. Uh, so the first thing is Tech Power Up GPU-Z. I find it's very helpful when it comes to knowing what video card you have and the big part is under the sensors this gives you an idea of what your clock speed is what your memory clock speed is what your voltage is and all that stuff so it can be very helpful to find out kind of what your limits are and why you're hitting those problems off the bat you don't technically need to have it running i usually don't open it up unless i'm really fine-tuning stuff and then you have hardware info which is more of a sensor program for the CPU and the motherboard and all that. Sometimes I found it does have 
uh, video card stuff in here, but almost always, depending on the video card, and depending on the computer, it might not give you any information. So actually, here it is. This does tell me the information about the video card. Uh, some people use this. Uh, it has the same information as GPU-Z, or C yeah, GPU-Z, but uh, it really depends on your preference there. Cause if you want to monitor your CPU at the same time, you can do that through this program. And then it comes to the actual overclocking programs. You really have two choices. Now, I take that back. You can actually use any program from any company. So Asus, Zotac, MSI, uh, EVGA, um, who else is there? PNY, they all have their own overclocking software. Um, and you can use their software, but I find that using uh, MSI Afterburner is the easiest to use and has the most functionality, I find. They always update it versus other programs that kind of sit there for a year or so without any updates. Does it make a difference? Not really. Once you get those clocks fine-tuned, it doesn't matter which software you use. I just prefer using MSI Afterburner. If you have a EVGA card, using Precision X can be helpful because they also have features that deal with just uh, the lighting you can do in here by yourself. That you can't do in other cards. You have a different way of looking at temperatures, and you can do this basically auto OC function. It's right here. I have a hard time with this working in EVGA Precision X, but you know, uh, try all you want and see what happens. And then, of course, they have the monitor section here. But for this video, we're gonna focus on MSI Afterburner. So we fire it up. And then if this looks different than your version, go find the gear symbol. And then under interface, you can change what the layout is. So I think when I first downloaded this, this is what uh, mine looked like. I, it depends on what website you download it from. Uh, if it's the newest version or older version, sometimes uh, if you're getting promotional page, they'll give you a promotional version of it. Uh, but anyways, you find the gear symbol. It's going to be on there somewhere. You click on it. This window is always the same. doesn't matter what version you're using. Interface, and I'm going to be using the cyborg, I think, the white skin. I just find it more easy to get around. It's, there's no actual reason. And if you're on 4K resolution, there's also a scaling option, which I kind of skip there there it is skin scaling i have 175 percent if you're on 4k monitor you probably want to 200 percent even see what you're looking at and then there's other functions that people like to use which is the monitoring you can do on screen display so when you are in the video game you can actually see on the screen the clock speeds and all that also helpful i have it left on right now but by default it's set off so you click on whatever you want so you want temperature you can turn it on and off and then you can tell what graph you want and then the last thing is voltage something i'll talk about in a second but if it's grayed out either you have a version that's not supported so i think beta one here i'm on beta two but the beta one doesn't have voltage support beta two does depending on what video card you have depending on what software you're using it's going to be different but basically you want to go under unlock voltage control and have that clicked and then hit apply and it probably will restart your software and then your slider right here will be nicely unlocked now if it's not unlocked don't worry about it it doesn't really make a big difference i'm going to talk about that in here in a second okay and the last piece of software i like to use when it, for free software is going to be msi combustor it's basically a stress test for your video card and uh, depending on what resolution you're running it it might stress it a little less, but for the most part, you're looking at a GP load of 100%, and that's what you're trying to aim for. Just keep in mind that if you are running this program, that your power draw is going to be pretty much the maximum the video card allows, and uh, when it comes to heat, you're going to be outputting a lot more heat than when you're playing video games. This is because this program is stressing the video card, whereas a lot of times when you play games, you know you're, you're getting a variant frame rate, you're not going to get you're not always going to be hitting 100 steady or whatever. It's always going to be moving around. So this is just a version of it showing a stressed out video card. So with that being said, we are done talking about the programs I use. Now, I do use other things like 3D Marks, and we're going to talk about why I use that. 
and then onto the software itself. So MSI Afterburner, once again, is what I'm going to be using here. If you don't have Vulture Slider, don't worry about it. But we're going to talk about before actually using the program, we're going to do two things. First, you want to get a baseline before you do any overclocking, and that means fire up your favorite game or benchmark or whatever, and then run it. And then we're going to you look at the score, and then as you overclocking, look at your score again. And I'll talk about why that's important in a little bit, but for now, let's go ahead and talk about the view card itself and the parameters you can set for here. So the first thing you want to talk about here is the voltage. The, this slider goes 100, 100%, it says plus 100, but it's really 100%. And all that means is that now the video card is allowed to draw up to 1.093 volts. And that is the safety of NVIDIA. You can't bypass this unless you have, unless you do a zombie mod, which is kind of like bypassing all the safeties and actually soldering wires onto the board. And it's meant for extreme overclockers, but more or less, unless you have a modified BIOS for the video card, which is not public, it has to be, get, you have to get it from forums or from overclocking clocking competitions. You can't raise the voltage past that. And I suggest you don't, unless you are on water cooling at least, and then liquid nitrogen for actual use. And now nobody plays canes with liquid nitrogen, but it's important if you're doing these kind of overclocking that you're doing world record setting. If you are not going for any of that stuff, then breaking the voltage limit is not going to make a difference for you. So that is the voltage here. And when I say that it brings up the voltage limit, if you look at this graph, this is the turbo boost graph. This is basically NVIDIA's boost. That's what they call it. They call it boost 3.0 or 4.0 actually now. And all that means is that at your voltage, whatever the voltage is, this is the plotted curve for your frequency. So if you are at, say, 1.1 volt, then your frequency is going to be about 2100, and that's where it sits at. Now, this can be moved around by its free by itself. So if you think that you want this voltage to be 2100, you can do that. Or you think it's too high, you can actually go like this. Either way, you can do both those directions there. That's for fine tweaking. You don't really need to do it right away. So we talk about the voltage, I guess, limit. It has little impact on overclocking for the newest generation video cards. And actually, it hasn't been a big impact for three or four generations now, just because of how NVIDIA Boost works. Now, let's actually talk about NVIDIA Boost, because that's a topic that's kind of misunderstood. And I made a whole video about it. I'll be linking below. But if you kind of don't want to watch another video, here's a quick version of that. Basically, NVIDIA has something called Boost, NVIDIA Boost, and it's on the fourth iteration right now. And basically, it means that your video card is governed by three different limits. The core voltage, the power limit, which is basically called power, power target, and temperature limit. Now, when you, one of these is reached, the video card will no longer boost higher than that frequency. So we're looking at here again, this is the graph, the curve for the default curve. If you hit 1.1 volt, this is where the video card stops at 2100 megahertz. It will not go above that because it is at voltage 1.1. Same goes with temperature. If your temperature is 91 degrees, at 86 degrees, the clock speed starts dropping down. And this is for a safety precaution here. And then power limit. Power limit deals with the amount of power the video card is allowed to draw. And the best way you can see that is inside uh, any of this monitoring software. So here you can actually see it here. There's a power percentage, and that just gives you a number based on whatever the power is going to be and the actual power draw. So once you hit this limit, and every card is different. That's, that's something interesting to note is that one video card might have 350 watt limit. The other card might have 370 watts. So like Founders Edition, when you set the power limit, it goes to 115%, which is the 370 watt power draw. This card only goes to 102%, which tops out at 346 watts. So there's a lot less power that the, the video card can actually give you. So that's important to understand that when you are hitting these frequencies, you're fighting voltage, you're fighting power, and you're fighting temperature. 
Generally, for the Ampere, I noticed you're not fighting temperature at all because you never really get above 70-something degrees, 72 or so. I really haven't experienced anything much higher than that. Voltage, also, once again, unless you're on the water cooling or if you're really pushing the clocks, that voltage slider might make a difference. But almost always, I've noticed that the video card instantly hits that power, power target limit um, on any of the versions, on the Founders Edition, on basically all the cards, which means that that is really the limitation of your overclocking based on how much power draw. There is ways around this. Once again, you can do a physical modification and bypass this, or you can wait for a modified BIOS to come out that allows you to have a higher power limit. But for now, we don't have those functions as a new overclocking guide because it's a new video card. So with that out of the way, now we can actually talk about how the overclock is. Since we understand the principles behind overclocking, now we can actually talk about the what to do when it comes to overclocking. And we have two, three options technically. We have core overclock, we have memory overclock, and then we have a cool little feature that kind of doesn't work right now, and it's called OC Scanner. And what it does, it, it scans basically every single voltage point here, and then basically checks it to his own reference, and then raises this based on what if it passes or fails. So I do have one saved here to save you guys the time. It's like half an hour to run that. If you were to hit scan, it takes about half an hour to finish. We don't have time to watch it go. I think I have a, I think I have a sped up version of that. Maybe I can put it on the screen. But so after I ran it, this is what we see. It's it determined that at 900 millivolts that the clock speed is can do 1900 versus before it was like 1850 or so. So that all this is doing is automatically moving these pointers to what is optimized for that voltage. It's a very neat program because basically it's, it's going off a of reference. So it's has a reference, I guess, reference package or file or whatever it has in the background running. And every time it raises the clock speed, it checks it against that reference. And if it fails that reference, then it clocks it back down. And it's a very good way to get your um, clock speed up without actually messing with anything. Now, if you were to ignore that and you just want to type in a number, so if you type in 45, and once again, this is something I didn't talk about yet, but NVIDIA only goes by 15, so, oops, 115. 15, 30, 45, increments of 15. If you do 50, it's going to bounce down to 45. If you do 55, it's probably going to bounce up to 60. I, I haven't really figured out where the switch is between does it go up or down. Does it always go to the lowest value or the highest value or the closest nearest neighbor kind of deal? But it is 15 only at a time, so there's no point in typing those other weird values because it's going to either go up or down and you won't actually know which direction it went. So if you, for example here, if I raise it to 45, and I go look at this, you can see that the entire graph is shifted up 45 megahertz. And what this means is that by default boost, the way the boost operates is that it has a base frequency. If I fire up a combustor and we see the clock speed here, it's bouncing back and forth. So it's already at the power limit. You can kind of see that it is hitting 100% and then it goes above quickly because it's kind of allowed to grab a little bit more power and then drops it back down and it goes up and down. And I don't like this new function. This used to be that once you hit over 100%, it wouldn't go above 100%. This kind of gives you, I guess, the newest version of Ampere. Uh, NVIDIA allows the range to kind of fluctuate. So if you're gonna pull 111, then the next time you pull 90. And so you're still hitting that 100, but what it does is it makes this kind of frequency jump back and forth. But the whole point is that we're hitting the power limit right here. And as you see, it fluctuates back and forth. But if I do plus 30, it's going to be 30 on top of what it's doing right there. So suddenly, we're reaching 125, where before we were reaching like 180 or 1980. And once again, here is an example. We are literally going 45 or 30 megahertz higher than what the little bar was before. So it's very linear overclocking whatever the video card is doing by default, and then on top of that. 
is what we're adding to it. So we're adding plus 30 across the board. And in many ways, when you do the auto OC graph, it actually is a little bit nicer because it kind of moves everything around for you automatically. We see that the clock speed can go up higher, but it's gonna be based on the application. So right now, this program puts a heavy load on the video card, and therefore we can kind of see easily what we're reaching. So if I were to type in 45, we can find out, does it crash, does it keep going? And you can keep going up and doing that. It does work to a point. It used to be the old version with old video cards in the previous generation. You just raised it until it crashed, dropped it down like 5, 10 megahertz, and then you're good to go. Our downside of this now is it doesn't do that anymore because the frequency jumps so much, You, it's hard to gauge is 225 stable or is it only 210 stable. And that is kind of an issue because of the voltages or I guess power limit. So let's crash the computer just to kind of give you an idea what happens. Yep, and then there's a hard freeze right there. Sometimes you can get around it. Sometimes you can actually bypass the hard freeze, but for the most part, once you, uh, oh, there it goes, I saved it. I was gonna say, for the most part, once you hit the hard freeze, you're kind of stuck until you restart the computer. Okay, so now I demonstrated what happens when you uh, raise the power too much. And let's kind of hit that home a little bit more. So if you were to fire a game up, sometimes certain clock speeds aren't stable. So I will say that we know that 45 might be stable. Let's go ahead and fire up uh, a game here. So I decided to go with Borderlands 3 to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So if we were to just fire off the benchmark with plus 45, it's gonna be sometimes hard to demonstrate, but if you, some games I found that you're stable at a higher frequency because the load is different. You're, you're kind of using a different part of the GPU, maybe you're not stressing as much or hitting that power limit. Or if you have a video card or a CPU, I mean, that is your game's CPU bound, especially at 1080p, your CPU bound versus 4K. So a lot of times when you're playing at 1080, for this video card, I found that it might crash, it might not crash. So plus 45 crashed this, this computer. Oh, I saved it. So plus 45 crashes the, this game, but say, it's probably a bad example, but say plus 30, may have no problems at all in this game, but it may crash it in a different game. Or even better, which I can't really show you because I'm limited by my recording, is that if you play that same game at 4K at 45 megahertz, it doesn't crash. So here's a good example. I have put it back to plus 45, and we're gonna run Time Spy. So there we go, we crashed the computer again at plus 45. I'm having bad examples here. So let's go ahead and try times by extreme at 45 and see if it crashes. So interesting enough here, if you play at high resolution or stress the video card more, plus 45 does not crash the computer. Once again, this is kind of how boost works and that's the most complicated part about overclocking the newest Ampere video cards is that one clock speed may be good for one resolution, but it's not good for the other resolution. So if you are doing combustor to stress out the video card, that clock speed is great for stressing out the video card. So let's talk about why this is. Why does time side extreme at plus 45 not crash the video card, but it does for time spy normal and also at 1080p? It's because at 1080p, the video card is not being stressed enough. You're more CPU bound than anything else is causing it to use less power. And then if you're using less power, then you allow the clock higher. So you still have a margin, you still have power left over for that higher clock speed and higher voltage. So something that was stable for a higher resolution is not stable at a lower resolution. So it's kind of the catch 22 is where you can't always have the same frequency for everything. So if you're, if you're playing all your games at 4K resolution, then a higher clock speed, that a boost clock speed will work. 
but if you're playing some games at low resolution or they don't stress the video card enough and then other ones do you're kind of playing that game where some games will crash some games won't crash so let's exit out of this as i have already done this before and show you that it does work this way so once again plus 45 that worked but it doesn't work when you are playing time spy or anything at 1080p so this is the very important thing uh, you want to lower the clock speed until everything you do does not crash but i kind of skipped a very valuable step and i think this is something that's interesting that you need to know and how to do it here's a screenshot to give you an idea of what i'm talking about when it comes to knowing what your clock speed was or what your score was before and afterwards so i took a screenshot of time spy and i just want the graphic score and this is my graphic score and my frame rate this is at stock settings so when i overclock the video card I'm aiming to have higher numbers on both. If they're lower, even if it's stable, and it doesn't crash the computer, then it makes no reason to, you're actually having more issues when it comes to overclocking. So you want your clock speed to go up, but you also want your graphic score to go up. If it doesn't go up, then you're running into some issues, stability issues. Now this can be reflected in games. You can pick your favorite game that has a benchmark, or maybe it has a counter at the top, play it, see what the, what the frame rate is or what the score is and then run it again with your overclock and see what the score is and the frame rate and ultimately what you want to do is you just want to slowly go up so you want your baseline at zero and then you want to do plus 15 if it's, it's presuming it doesn't crash the computer you want to try plus 15 plus 30 and then plus 40 and you keep going up most video cards i found without any special treatment are going to reach about 45 is the max before you start running into just stability issues and crashing. So let's go with plus 30. Now we have our baseline number and we could run this again and see what happens. But there's another way to do the next part. The next section is dealing with memory overclocking. Now I like to do both separately. So I know my maximum core clock, and then I find out my maximum memory clock. Now the memory for this is GDDR, GDDR6X, and it's a little bit special now because NVIDIA has now added two more bits to the pipeline. So now it's four bits encoded instead of two. Uh, two on the rise and two on far, fall on the memory, which means that now it's much more sensitive to temperature and voltage which we can't control the voltage, but it's much more sensitive to temperature. So as your video card warms up, as you play long sessions, you might find that your memory overclock fails when it didn't before. And it's very, very common. So most people, you can type in 800, right? And it will fire up. Some games won't crash, some games will. And then if you run it, I don't know, three or four minutes, it'll crash the video card. Here's the other problem. Now NVIDIA has added a CRC check to the memory, which means that if you overclock the memory or actually just even stock, if it comes back with an error, just like normal server memory, when it hits an error, it's gonna check it against the value. If it's wrong, then it's gonna ask for the same information again, which means that while it may not crash the computer, it is wasting time trying to get more information again when it got false information. So while 800 might not crash the computer at all, it's probably not gonna be very stable Pretty much people doing 800 or so are on liquid nitrogen because just because the memory can go so much cooler. I found for just short in the video, I found that I, my limit was 400. And the way I found 400 was a limit is that I just kept raising it in increments basically of 100 because it was easier to do that. I ran it against the benchmark and then I checked it and I kept doing it and doing it until I hit the limit of 400. And then I went to the games and it passed all games. Now here's the other thing is that memory is uh, different for every video card. So the Founders Edition, I couldn't go higher than 25. That was the highest I can go on the Founders Edition. If I typed in 50, it would crash the computer. On this video card, I can type in 400, 800, 1000, and it won't crash the computer. So it really depends on what board partner. Now is 400 better than the Founders Edition 25? Yes, but in the same time, it doesn't make a difference in games right now because the way the memory how much bandwidth the memory has now in the Ampere generation is very, very little. It's like 0.5% difference between high clock and low clock memory. 0.5 is not enough to 
be scalable in games is, is inside the margin of error when you're doing benchmarking and testing. So it's something you really can't measure very well. But for those who really do care about getting the most performance out of your memory, overclock, set it to zero, run stress tests or benchmarks, and then see as you, as you go up if your score goes up. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to plus 30, I'm going to do plus 400, and then we're going to run it through and see what our score is afterwards. So now the benchmark is complete, we can see my old score was 18798, and the new one is 19149. So it's not a big difference if you go back to frame rate 126.53, 123.93, one oh eight forty nine and one oh six so we gain like two frames a second and this is pretty standard so if you're really into tweaking your video card that's pretty much we're gonna get out of it but once again it's kind of a tutorials kind of give you an idea of what you can do with your own video card because not all of them are the same they all kind of clock differently but you're gonna be looking at the range of not more than 45 in the core and probably not much more than 400 on the mem memory if you even get that high so that wraps up this video. Thank you for watching and sticking to the end. This is a overclocking guide for the RTX 380. Once again, not the best, most exciting overclock I've ever done, but it kind of gives you an idea of what you can do with your video card. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give this video a thumbs up so it can go up higher in Google ratings. And as always, have a great day.